Hello everyone and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. Aircraft carriers can carry up to 75 aircraft on their flight decks. But the real intrigue lies below deck, particularly in a small, crucial space that plays an essential role in launching planes. first rising to prominence during World War II in the early 1940s. Aircraft carriers have remained among the most reliable and formidable combat vessels in military history. They also played a central role in the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Throughout the Pacific theater, aircraft carriers were instrumental in major naval battles, including the battles of the Coral Sea, Midway, and Leyte Gulf. Interestingly, the U.S. Navy's journey into carrier aviation began with the USS Birmingham, which launched the first aircraft from a ship in 1910 in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Somewhere in the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, a carefully choreographed operation unfolded on October 2nd, 2015. That day, precise coordination between the flight control team and the launch bubble took over center stage aboard the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, or CBN-69. The flight deck crew maneuvered critical equipment across the deck of the 48-year-old nuclear-powered aircraft carrier as part of its dedicated development testing for the F-35C Stealth Strike Fighter. How does it work? To understand, let's explore a day in the life of the specialized crew members who operate on an aircraft carrier's flight deck. This at-sea trial expected to span at least 14 days, was led by the Salty Dogs of Air Test and Evaluation Squadron 23, or VX-23. Supporting the operation was the F-35C Lightning II Pax River Integrated Test Force, whose involvement marked a significant milestone in integrating next-generation aircraft with carrier-based operations. When it comes to teamwork between different military branches, there's no better display than Rim of the Pacific exercise drills. Held every other year since 1971, Rim of the Pacific, or RIMPAC, focuses on collaboration and communication for all of the different branches of the U.S. Armed Forces. Working as a team, this global training drill was participated in by almost 30 countries, 40 ships, and over 170 subs and planes. Besides this, though, each aircraft carrier's Ouija board controls every movement on board. Spanning from Hawaii to California, this maritime miracle is a magnificent example of sustaining and fostering cooperative team relationships. Not only do manned aircraft operate from aircraft carriers, but so can drones. The U.S. Navy has made an effort to produce unmanned aircraft that can operate from aircraft carriers. Boeing developed the MQ-25, the world's first operational carrier-based unmanned aerial tanker. The aircraft was developed under the U-Class, or Unmanned Carrier Launched Aerial Surveillance and Strike Program, 
a carrier-based autonomous aerial vehicle with refueling capabilities. The ultimate result of the program was the MQ-25 Stingray, which would extend the combat range of fighters with aerial refueling. The first prototype of the tanker is undergoing different flight tests in various locations. The aircraft is powered by one Rolls-Royce AE-307N engine that delivers a maximum thrust of 10,000 pounds. It underwent a dock handling test on board the aircraft carrier USS George H.W. Bush, claiming successful results in the end. How well the engine tackles the winds at the deck will be decisive, as the tanker is intended for carrier-based operations. During the deck handling test in 2021, MQ-25 went through taxiing, parking on the deck, and connecting to the catapult system of the carrier. Flight deck directors with yellow shirts treated the Stingray just like any manned aircraft on the deck. A deck handling operator executed the flight deck director's commands via a handheld deck control device, or DCD, specifically designed for the MQ-25. During the tests, the tanker had its aerial refueling store mounted under the left wing. The store houses a hose and a drogue, a ram air turbine or rat, and space for 300 U.S. gallons of fuel. The ram air turbine, located at the front, drives a hydraulic pump that provides pressure for fuel pumps and hose extension. The Navy is yet to conduct catapult launches of the tanker from its Nimitz and Ford-class carriers. Each carrier-based aircraft, either manned or unmanned, undergoes deck trials during its development phase. X-47B performed the same test as MQ-25 a decade ago to prove its conformity to carrier-based operations. This unmanned combat aerial vehicle, or UCAVE, completed its deck tests with good grades. Aircraft carrier Harry S. Truman received the X-47B in late 2012 to take the drone to a spin in the ocean for the very first time in history. This was the first time an aircraft carrier welcomed an unmanned aerial vehicle to its deck. Upon completion of the first at-sea trials, X-47B continued its carrier-based tests on the supercarrier USS George H.W. Bush, performing its first catapult launch on May 2013. After a successful launch, the aircraft performed low approaches to the carrier and landed at Naval Air Station, or NAS, in Paxutant River in Maryland. From catapult launching to landing, the aircraft underwent accurate navigation and transferred from one mission control station to another, proving its operational capability. Being an unmanned vehicle, X-47B does not complicate the handling, but follows the standard protocol while on the deck and when transferred from the hangar bay to the flight deck. The flight deck director commands the drone while the deck handling operator executes the commands via the handheld control display unit, or CDU, that maneuvers the aircraft on the deck. The control unit has the sole control authority of engine thrust, nose wheel steering, and braking. An aircraft carrier without its catapult launchers is just dead weight floating on the sea. The catapult system has to be in the correct working order as it catapults million-dollar airplanes with invaluable souls on board. All 10 Nimitz-class supercarriers owned by the U.S. Navy come with steam-powered catapult systems. As the name implies, the muscle pressure for the catapult is provided 
by the steam generated from the ship's two nuclear reactors. Generated steam is stored within a 16,000-gallon wet accumulator and supplied to launch engine pistons that run on two cylindrical tracks just below the flight deck. A tow bar from the aircraft's nose gear is extended and attached to the shuttle assembly. The shuttle assembly is internally connected to the launch engine pistons. A holdback device connected to the nose gear from the rear holds the aircraft while the pilot applies full thrust on the engines. Once the catapult officer, or the shooter, releases the launch valve and the accumulator, steam is routed to the pistons, releasing the holdback and rocketing the shuttle with the aircraft forward along the track. The launch engine pistons are designed to deliver a tremendous force that could accelerate a 48,000-pound aircraft from zero to 165 miles per hour in just two seconds. The track length of the catapult is 300 feet. When the shuttle reaches the end of the track, a water brake retards the movement. The shuttle and pistons are taken back to the battery position via a spring-loaded latching device named GRAB. After each launch, the GRAB is moved to the end of the track along the shuttle track and latches with the shuttle to pull it back to the battery position. The steam pressure drops within the accumulator after each launch and a fill valve opens automatically to admit steam to pressurize the accumulator for another launch. Aircraft carriers have to be able to refuel their onboard aircraft, whether on deck or in the sky. But how do they refuel the aircraft carrier? Even though the carrier itself operates from nuclear reactors, the planes it carries operate off of aviation fuel. The U.S. Navy has long perfected the process of refueling ships while at sea. Before the 20th century, the refueling process of a ship relied on coaling stations set in key locations for the fleets to get the required fuel during their travels. However, this demanded multiple defended locations during times of warfare which resulted in an infrastructure that was constantly in danger in case of any disruption. The development of a new system in which a ship could be refueled at sea by another ship, called underway replenishment, started in the early 20th century, achieving operational use during World War I and was used extensively during World War II. After this period, the alongside connected replenishment method was created to transfer liquid fuel as well as ammunition and goods between ships. Nowadays, newer technologies like the standard tensioned replenishment alongside method or the involvement of aircraft, such as helicopters, are used to transfer cargo in a method called vertical replenishment. The refueling process requires using a span wire fueling rig that extends the hose from the delivering ship to the receiving ship at a safe distance. To connect the system, a pneumatic line thrower launches the messenger line that pulls the transfer lines to the receiving ship. In the case of bigger ships like aircraft carriers, multiple rigs are used to increase the load transfer rate. It is important for the crew to maintain control over the safe distance between the ships, as two ships getting closer might create a suction event and an eventual crash. The arrival of the 21st century led to the development of a new design with a heavier capacity. 
This meant that the system could transfer 25 loads of 12,000 pounds per hour. From steam-powered catapults to unmanned aerial refueling drones, aircraft carriers represent the pinnacle of naval innovation and coordination. Every operation, whether launching a fighter jet or conducting underway replenishment, relies on precision, communication, and an unbreakable chain of teamwork both above and below deck. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.